One of the wonderful things about our Be Rich effort is, and particularly today since our emphasis is on give, is it gives us a chance to both practice giving together and the power of giving and to talk about it uh, for a minute, to talk about the power of giving. So if you're able to stand, please do so. And I want to read just a passage uh, where I've been for the last several weeks, if you've been with us, John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Shout amen. amen. Please be seated. Everybody shout, he gave. He gave. He gave. If you've been with us for several weeks, you know I've pulled out at least four elements that defines God's love as reflected in this verse, which is being spoken by Jesus. The world, in the context of this verse, for God so loved the world, uh, embodies every person ever to be born. So that means, when it says, for God so loved the world, it really means that this is how God loves you. Tell the person next to you, this is how God loves you. This is how God loves you. And there's been four elements. I want to focus on two of those elements today in a little bit more detail. The first uh, insight is, uh, and you've heard it before if you've been with us, is that uh, one of the ways that God loves us is through the fact that God is generous. That's one of the ways that he loves me. And it all flows out of the word love, which is really translated in the Greek, God so loved, is really agape. God agapied us. Uh, tell the person next to you, I agape you. <laughs> ask the other person, ask somebody else, do you agape me? <laughs> Agape, this is this incredible expression of God's love that at the very heart of it is this unconditional generosity. So uh, 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 here's another way of, of saying it. Just, just say this with me. Uh, I'm so loved. I'm so precious. I'm so cherished by God that he gave his son for me. That is the message of God's love. That is the message of God's love, that he gave his son for you because he loves you. And so there's a generosity. Secondly, uh, uh, there's this notion of God's love being unconditional. Everybody shout, unconditional. Unconditional. I have two kids, as uh, some of you know. Uh, my son is 28 years old and my daughter is 15. And both of them, as I have raised them, uh, I've often said the same thing to them, and yet recently I've been kind of critiquing uh, this particular thing that I've said to them. One of the reasons why it's important, I think, to come to church and, and to listen to the teaching is that it ought, to, uh, it ought to challenge us sometimes to critique ourselves. And so I've been critiquing a little bit of, of something that I've said to both of my kids, and Lauren uh, because she's the youngest, more recently. Here's basically what I say to her. I say, look, as long as you make uh, wonderful grades and treat people right, you can get almost, shout almost, almost anything you want from me. That's what I tell her. You can get almost anything you want from me. And so my intent behind that statement is to incentivize her, to encourage her, to reinforce really good behavior. That, that I want to encourage her, do your good, best job with your grades, etc. But it dawned on me recently that if I'm not careful, I could unintentionally uh, send Lauren the wrong message. You see... Uh, uh, if you do good work and bring home great grades and treat people right, uh, that's, that, that, that's performance. Everybody shout performance. Uh, uh, then I will give you almost, you can ask me for almost anything 
And I'll give it to you. Shout generosity. generosity. Now, here's the reality. Uh, uh, shout give. Yeah. Shout love. Yeah. Shout give. Yeah. Shout love. Yeah. You see, the two are tied together. That, that when we give, it is an expression of love. So here's what I don't want to I don't want Lauren to end up thinking that her performance, uh, that my love expressed through generosity is somehow conditioned on her performance. So we have to be careful as parents and as grandparents because, because if she concludes that my love is conditioned upon her performance, then she won't, she'll hide her poor grades if she makes poor grades, right? Uh, 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 she will, if she makes poor choices, she won't tell me about it because she's too, too concerned with the fact that maybe dad won't love me. So I've had to revert back to another saying that I, I used to say, and if you're out of the African-American tradition, you'll get this. And uh, so that she and, and my son will get the right message. And so here's what I'm working on, reminding her. Uh, as long as I'm black, <laughs> and as long as I'm alive, there's two things she can't change. I will always be her daddy. And I will always love her. I, she can't change those. She can't change me, stop me from being a daddy. And there is nothing she can or cannot do that will stop me from loving her. Now I'm agoping my daughter. You see? Because God's agape love has three components that we need to be aware of. One, of course, there's feelings involved, and a lot of us think that God doesn't love us because we've done some things, or we've said some things, whatever the case is, and, and we know that God doesn't necessarily feel good about what we've done or what we've been engaged in. Uh, and so feelings are relative, that, that with our kids and our spouses, you know, I try to tell married people this when I get ready to marry all the time, listen, feelings are going to go and come, right? Shout Feelings. Feeling, 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 feeling. Today you're happy, tomorrow you're upset. Today you get it right, tomorrow you get it wrong. Feeling's going to come, even with God. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 uh, and 6, uh, the, the scripture says that, that God looked at humanity, saw all of the evil work we were doing, all of the evil stuff we were imagining, and he was sorry. One version says it grieved him that he made us. And, and this, this ends up by saying it literally broke his heart. But God's love is more than feelings. Now, I hear people say all the time, uh, you can't help who you fall in love with. Just fall in love. They're talking about chemistry. Be careful following your chemistry. Because I know I got some folk in here that can say amen to the fact that chemistry can end you up in some bad places. Come on now. And, and, and you will wake up one day and say, God, I need a chemistry transplant. <laughs> cut it off. Cut it off. So God brings more than feelings to this notion of love. He brings what I call enduring commitment. A commitment that endures all the ups and downs, all the bad stuff and good stuff about our lives. For example, listen in Jeremiah uh, 31, 3, here's what he says to Israel, and they're in trouble. They're in exile. He says to them, look, I told you long ago that I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's what God is saying, is that I'm committed to you. Listen, some of you are in relationships and... And you hold over the other person's head. If you don't get it right, I'm leaving. If you don't stop, it, I'm leaving. Now, I'm not talking about physical abuse and sex abuse. You ought to leave that. But I'm talking about the rest of it. Some of y'all can't take nothing. And the worst thing you can do is to say to somebody you're supposed to be in love with, 
uh, 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 you know, one more time of this or that, I'm gone, I'm gone, I'm gone, I'm gone, because you're signaling to them that, that, that they cannot trust the stability of your commitment. You ain't agoping them. And then the third component is God makes a decision. It's an irreversible decision. Shout decision. decision. Irreversible. In Romans uh, uh, 5, 9, it says, uh, you know, that while we were helpless, Christ came and died for sinners. He can't reverse that. He made that decision as an eternal testament to his love. That God gave his only begotten son. That's, a, that's, a, that's an irreversible decision. Jesus doesn't back back and rewind life back, reverse the cross and reverse it. No. It's an irreversible decision. Here's the point. What I'm saying to the Lord is that I will always be your dad and I will to love you as me. That, that, that I have a commitment that will endure all of the ups and downs of life. And that I, you can depend on the fact that I've made an irreversible decision to love you. That's what God is saying to all of us. He agapes us. Shout agape. agape. The third insight then is that um, God has not only simply decided to love us with, a, with agape, he has decided to love others, to agape others through our generosity. Through your generosity, through my generosity. Now, let me explain it this way. The DNA of God's agape love includes unconditional generosity. And if you and I are children of God, then we're supposed to bear the same DNA in how we love others. Let me prove it from the text. Jesus is talking in Matthew chapter 5, verse 44 and 45. Listen to what he says. He says, but I say, love your enemies. When you start loving your enemies, that's generosity. And that's unconditional. In other words, you're saying, I'm going to love you if you're my friend, and I'm going to love you if my enemy. That's unconditional generosity. Watch this. Then he says, pray for those who persecute you. When you pray for those who persecute you, come on now, that's generosity. And that's unconditional generosity because you're not just going to pray for folk who like you. You're saying, even if you don't like me and you persecute me, I'm going to still pray for you. That's unconditional generosity. Now watch what he said. He says, in that way, listen for the DNA now. Everybody shout DNA. DNA. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. How do we know? For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends his rain on both the just and the unjust. He's describing God's unconditional generosity. I can prove it. Maybe you messed up bad last night, but when you got up this morning, come on now, the sun shined on you like it shined on everybody else. And what God is saying, this word, is that his, un, his the DNA of his unconditional generosity should be at work in how we love because he wants to agape others through our generosity. Well, let me, let me demonstrate it through this text. Most of us are familiar with 1 John 3.16, but we have not connected it to verse 17. Let's connect the two verses. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. Unconditional generosity. So, we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. Next verse. 
If someone has enough money to live well here in Silicon Valley and sees a brother or sister, come on now, at Santee Elementary School, sees a brother or sister at the Garfield School, sees a brother or sister at the school in Guatemala that we'll hear about in a moment, a uh, 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 Gafi school in Nigeria, sees a brother or sister, come on now, across the street in need, but shows no compassion, how can God's DNA love be in that person? See the insight? Boy, this is challenging to all of us, including me. And what the text is saying, that God continues to challenge us to become greater givers. Because through our generosity, he loves us. Now here's another passage that I found to be really fascinating. Look what Paul says in Acts 20. This is just Fascinating. He says, and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need, watch this, by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Let me translate. Here's what Paul is saying. Paul says, I'm an example of what it looks like to go to work and earn a paycheck, not just to pay your bills, but to also be a blessing to folk in need. That's what he says. He says, for I've discovered that it's more blessed to give than to receive. Here's the insight. Last week I talked about hearing from God. Here's the deal. If you want the whispering of God to get louder in your life, if you, if you want the the prodding of God to become more pronounced in your life. If you want more revelations from God about how to interact on your job and, and make more effective decisions inside of your relationships, uh, then continue to become and grow in the area of giving. See? Why? Because if you have a posture that says, I'm willing to give, then your pastor says, I'm willing to be an instrument of God's grace and love. Shall give. Yeah. Shall love. love. Now, here's a, here's a scripture I ran across the other day. Actually, it was last night. And it was, it was a bit hilarious. And, and immediately, last night became one of my favorite scriptures. I just ran across it last night. It's Proverbs 23. Listen to this. This is fascinating. Don't eat with people who are stingy. Don't desire their delicacies. They are always thinking about how much it costs. Eat and drink, they say, but they don't mean it. <laughs> now, if you're sitting by that person, don't look at them. <laughs> but we all know folks like this, right? Now, in the Hebrew context, when it says, don't eat and fellowship, eating with folk was deep communion, deep fellowship. It's where deep relationships were formed. And what he's saying is, be careful and don't allow folk who are stingy, meaning who have closed hearts, to close your heart. Right, because, because when the heart closes, come on now, the hand closes, but, but an open hand reflects an open heart. God says, I call my people to be open-hearted and open-handed people. All right. Let me transition. Let me give you three reasons not to give. Tell somebody, I'm sure I'm glad to hear this. I can't wait. <laughs> three reasons not to give, biblically. Number one, don't give to be seen. By others. This is Jesus talking. He's teaching this in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 2 and 4. Here's what he says. When you give to someone in need, don't do it as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward. 
But when you give, watch what he says in verse 4. Uh, let your gifts be in private. And your father who sees everything will reward you. Yes. Right? When you write your check for $39.95 or for several thousand as it relates to be rich or less, whatever the check is, it's written, watch this. Don't tell anybody this is what I wrote so they can get, you can get your praise. You do it quietly. And when we raise more than $70,000 because of your giving uh, and we're going to give it away, we won't give it in your name. They're not going to know who you are. They're going to say, where did this money come from? We're going to say, it comes from New Beginnings Community Church. And say, what is that? That's a community of Jesus, Father. Why are they being so generous? Because we want you to know that God sees you. God loves you. That you matter to God. Yeah. Here the text says. All right. Don't give to be seen. Secondly, you're going to really like this one because some of y'all feel a little pressure right now. So you're going to really like this. Uh, tell the person next to you, listen up, listen up, listen up. <laughs> Don't give because of pressure. Amen. Hear that? Here's the a, here's a text. Here's the text. 2 Corinthians 9, 7. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves the person who gives what? Cheerfully. Cheerfully. So at the end of the day, you can't make a decision to give because you're being pressured to give. You've got to make a decision to give because you're so desperately committed uh, to loving God more. Come on now. Uh, and loving People more like God. Loving others the way God loves. Let me, let me give you the third one. Don't give because of greed. Everybody shout greed. Now I know you're wondering, how is it possible for me to give because of greed? Well, let me give you an example. I checked the lotto numbers <laughs> thing. And the mega one is up to $90 million, I believe. And the other one, jackpot, y'all know because you keep up with it, is $130 million. So I wanted to know what happens to the money when you give it, when you get the tickets. So I discovered some interesting things. One amusing thing, it says <laughs> a, sm <laughs> a small percentage of it goes to help gamblers anonymous. <laughs> A small percentage. The rest of it, whatever state's participating, is really kind of goes into their deficit fund. That they use it to, to kind of backstop uh, repairing roads and, and uh, helping with schools and, 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 and supporting police and firemen and women and that's how that's what they use their money for. Now, I'm not going to bet, but if I was betting, I would bet that not any of you who bought 20 tickets yesterday did so because you wanted to support Gamma's Anonymous. Oh, you wanted to help the police. Come on now. Oh, you wanted to build some roads. Oh, wonderful, charitable things. No, let me tell you why you bought your tickets. You bought your tickets because it said $130 million jackpot. Now, I'm not dogging you out. Go ahead and buy your lottery tickets. And if you win, tie. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. I don't know what else somebody says. See, I know it just for the preachers. I do it. Here's my insight, though. Don't give to God and on behalf of God the way you play the lottery. Don't give to get. See, we've manipulated the text so often. 
we, we, we go, I, in Genesis chapter uh, 3, you hear, it talks about Abel brought first fruit. Shout first fruit. First fruit. And, 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 and God blessed it. It's the first fruit of And I believe in bringing first fruit to God. That's the, that's the, 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 the best off the top, you see. And, 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 and giving it first to God. And yet, somebody looked at that text and said, I want to be blessed by God, so let me bring my first fruits. Shout motivation. motivation. Wrong motivation. Wrong. See? Uh, tithing. Malachi 3 says, bring, bring your tithe into the storehouse and prove me that I will open up the windows in heaven and pour you out a blessing that is larger than you can receive. And some of you shout motivation. Some of you looked at that text, right? And the question is about your motivation. You said, you said, you know what? I want a blessing larger than I receive, so I'm going to pay my tithes. You've missed the point. Jesus says in Luke, give, and it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And some of us come out of context where, where the decision was made, I want my life to be uh, so full Press down, shaking together, running over. That's why I'm going to give. Wrong motivation. You missed the point. Why should I give? And Jesus gives us the answer. Matthew 6, 33. That's what he says. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Above all else. Everybody shout first. Because you love God. Come on now. And because you want to love the way that God loves uh, uh, seek above all else live righteously and he will give everything you need now what does that mean here's what it means if you take care of God's business God will take care of your business that's the whole point right bring first fruit come on what, what God is trying to say is don't allow fear to keep you from being generous I'm afraid that, you know, my life is going to fall. Don't allow worry about how things are going to come together to keep you from being generous. God is saying you can't go wrong being generous in his name on his behalf. If you bring the first fruit, he'll bless your life. Come on, you pay the tithes, he'll give you a blessing larger than you can, can, can withhold. You give, it'll come back to you. It's built into the economy of where life is shaped. Don't worry. Don't be afraid to be generous. That's his point. But you don't give to get. You give because you've already been blessed. And you want to be a blessing. So, I want you to look at this video. And then we're going to wrap this up. I'm going to show you some people we give into through this effort. Down in these dumps, it's like you have, you know, hawks flying over and dogs just, you know, rummaging through whatever they can eat. It's very smoky because they're burning trash at the same time. Chimaltenango is basically a, a town that's filled with poverty. Many of the people that live there work at the dumps. Um, they, we're talking like whole families. They need all the family to work in order for them to survive. Sometimes they don't know where their next meal is coming from, so they pull all their resources together. They live in extreme poverty. It's not just the parents, but the kids are also working there. Luis was down there and he had a heart for getting these kids in education. You know, if they, they got an education, they could do something more than work in the dump. So Luis said to them, you know, what if we take the children in the morning, you know, from 7.30 to about 12.30, and then they can go back and then they can work in the dumps. Through the sponsorships that we have at NBCC, we've started a food program. Sometimes that's the only meal that they're going to eat all day. Through our 
our sponsorships, our support, our prayers for my special treasures. We get to be a part of that, and I'm very excited about that. I'm so appreciative, and I know they are, from the bottom of their hearts, so appreciative for our partnership with uh, with my special treasures, or mi especial tesoro. <laughs> Celebrate, celebrate. Three or four years ago, I was there. I met Luis and his wife, who started this work out of nothing. I met his father-in-law, who passed the church right across the street, who their church prays for and take the little bit they have to try to resource this work, which includes an orphanage where kids have been abused. I served breakfast out of the, 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 the food that you, your funding, has provided. I served those kids. I, I prayed for women in the dump with flies flying around. This is real. Why would we give to them? Why? Number one, we give to them because... Because we want to love God more. And we want to love the way God loves others. Why? There are other reasons. But let me just stop at this second one here. Because, because we, we are supportive. I wrote in a note. We support the church and its vision. It's deeper than that. Because hopefully we are a part of the church and its vision. Every believer, we say this every year, every believer ought to have a financial plan that supports his or her local church that they are part of. If you're part of this church, you ought to have a financial plan that supports this church, it, it really has uh, three elements to it. One, it means that you ought to decide ahead of time what percentage of your income that you're going to give is an invest in the work of the church. I believe in tithing. I see tithing as kind of is the standard. But uh, uh, for some of you, you may you can start with 10%. So I suggest think about 4%. Shout Percentage. And secondly, you need to be a regular giver in the, in the sense that the scripture Paul says, look, set your money aside at the first day of the, of the week. In other words, give to God first. Third, it ought to be progressive. Shout progressive. 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 Meaning it's 4% this week, and this year. Next year it's 6%. Next year it's 10%. And, 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 and you don't stop at 10, you keep moving as God keeps blessing. Uh, I've got folk here who give half of their annual in, half of their income away. Not just to the church, but to the church plus charities all over the place. Doing the work of God. Now, if this is your first time being here, your second time here, and it's like, I don't know this church, and I'm a little nervous, it's feeling like it's like tripping me out, don't give to this church. I say this every year, don't give to us. But give somewhere. Help some needy, some poor. Get engaged in the world in God's work somewhere. Now, if you're a part of this church and you're simply using as an excuse, I don't know will I trust the church, but in reality, you're just stingy. <laughs> God is pulling on your heartstrings right now. He said, make a decision, make a commitment. Make a plan. Stick by it. You know, I'll end here. If you've been around long enough, you've heard me tell this story, but it's so real. It changed me and Rhonda so deeply. I'll just share it again. When we were in Roxbury leading the church, that develop all these programs that the community desperately needed but we couldn't house it the building needed to be renovated Rhonda was just finishing graduating from medical school and uh, we were about to buy a new home 
And I said to her, I said, dear baby, I think the Lord has said, uh, before we buy a home, let's figure out what the mortgage would be, multiply it across three years, and let's pledge it to the church. Let's build the church house first, and then we'll get ours second. And Rhonda, just getting ready to come out of medical school, <laughs> said, and who told you that? <laughs> She's like, I ain't heard nothing from no nothing. We, we had a conversation about it. Ultimately, as an act of faith, she committed. Several months later, the CEO of the hospital that she was finishing up her residency at called her in his office and said, look, we've never done this before. As a matter of fact, we want you to keep this confidential for, uh, 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 and don't tell anybody, but we want to keep you. As a matter of fact, we want to keep you so bad after you graduate that here's what we're going to do. You have $300,000 worth of medical school loans. If you work for us for five years, we'll pay every cent of it off. And they paid every cent of it off. Come on now. All right. Did we give that big pledge so that her medical school loans would be paid off? No. We had no idea of that. Come on. We gave to be faithful to the work of God. And God came back and said, I got you. That changed me in Rhonda's life. It changed how we how we lived out our faith. And it made a huge difference that ricocheted throughout not just Roxbury, but Boston. That's what God wants to do in your life. Shall give, yeah. shall love, yeah. shall give. Yeah. It's all the same thing. Shout amen. amen. Come on, give God a hand, praise.